questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Martin. Uh, I'm a web developer. <laughs> <laughs> question to, to, to your API, API, API talk is, um, Mike. Uh, Mike. Yeah. Mike. 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 Yeah. Hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you ever think about um, using not JSON as an um, a, uh, API format or like having actually HTML or as, 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 as real API format for every client? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, basically, yeah. I've heard, I've heard this on and off a few for the last few years. People have occasionally talked about this idea of, of serving HTML as an actual data format because you can use DOM manipulation tools to get into it, and you can use just CSS selectors, and it can be quite powerful. Uh, but I haven't really seen anyone uh, take you know haven't seen it take off, and in a way. Sort of like it's kind of equivalent to JSON anyway. If you're going to use HTML just for, for pure data, I guess the argument is that you can then use uh, you can then inject it into a page. So it's kind of like a view and a, a, a data format that's passable at the same time. But I, I guess just from the point of view of tools and familiarity, it's still probably an experimental idea. But I think uh, I would definitely encourage you if you've got ideas to, to explore it because I think it's got the potential. Actually, uh, what you're describing is uh, is uh, the, the the way XML with XSL was supposed to work. Uh, that you would get as a response to an API call, you would get a piece of XML, and in the browser you would transform that uh, using uh, XSL uh, process, XSL queries and, and templates, and so on. Um, the um, actually, I think it was a great technology because. Uh, had a lot, lots of potential, and especially the XSLT processing that was available mainly in IE was very powerful. The, the one reason I think that there is a, some of a, somewhat of a bad reputation with XML. I think people try to do too much using XML, like programming languages where you would do ifs in, in XML. That was clearly stupid. And uh, also, uh, uh, XSL as a programming language, well, it's, uh, I would say the only mainstream, I don't think I can't, I can't call it mainstream, but the only uh, widely available uh, functional, purely, purely functional language. Um, and that's disconcerting for a lot of people. So it, it was even for me the first time I, I wrote my first piece of XSL. I, the only thought I had, I had is how can I change this, the way this language works? doesn't make sense to me. Uh, it took some time for me to understand. So um, I guess it, it was too complicated. That's, that's why I didn't take off. But the end, I like the idea still. Serving a piece of XML, using a tone processor to, to do whatever you want with it. That was a sound idea, I think. Um, in addition to that, coming from the other side, there's actually um, a great talk uh, which was held at SoundCloud, oh, Jesus, <laughs> um, where the guy actually pointed out that HTML has some features that JSON is lacking that it would need to be actually properly restful. And they're actually working on that with a standard calling um, JSON Home. Because one of the major features of HTML that JSON does not have is the, the link feature, where you would say, okay, here's a link. And the purpose of this link is a style sheet, or a JavaScript, or now an import in another HTML file. And JSON would need that to say something like, hey, here's a link, here's another resource, which contains your user document, and here is your friend's document. And so that JSON clients, which is something you uh, think edge on the end, that you should have a self-documenting API where uh, query would not only give you the stuff you need, but also links that lead you to other resources to give you a more complete picture of what you're actually looking at. 
And uh, if someone has a spare time, you should definitely look at Jason Home because even though no REST client right now does support that, it makes um, APIs suddenly make uh, be intuitive, which I think right now can, nobody can claim this API is intuitive. You always have to look at the documentation. Um, to link, uh, to link to 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 your talk, um, would you think that um, something like um, 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 N uh, not Angular, uh, Polymer uh, would would help to get something like an HTML API in, a, in, a, in an understandable format so that you can uh, get rid of all the boilerplate that that you add for just displaying the stuff so that you have like a pure um, um, pure data view of your um, of your of, of your resource and then having it um, displayed via the <laughs> JavaScript um, yes <laughs> um, so I actually had somewhat like that idea. So um, the first thing I did in Polymer was actually writing a front-end router which would not only root but also contain for each root the templates that are going to be displayed when that route is being addressed. Um, and at some point this basically turned into um, you had data that was being thrown at your page with like a marker and this marker decides which template is going to be and the template <coughs> renders this particular data. So if you would put some sort of standard above that, you would actually just have a web client and just point it to any API endpoint that you can find on the web and display that data and even manipulate it. So, um, but that's not really something that Polymer makes possible for the first time. It just makes it really easy, in my opinion. Um, one thing to add about that rendering aspect is there's actually much more potential to do that now with CSS3 because of box layout and HTML traditionally has always been somewhat tied to the view because uh, it kind of goes in the same direction. It was very hard using absolute positioning or whatever to change things around from the direction that the actual HTML comes in as how it's rendered on the page, but now it's actually possible, or it's a, li a little bit easier now anyway, so that would actually help the argument. Hi, I'm T. Uh, I'd like to change the topic a bit, because I'm really interested in, in what you think about it. Um, now, something like three years after Wave, um, and for me was Wave really um, an interesting um, um, iteration of the idea of the web um, and I think some parts of it are really important like, like what you are showing like you, you take a Google Plus page and take the content and do something with it but if someone else is posting it's not recognized on your web page because there is no glue so do you see some... F5. What? F5. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So do you see some, some real-time components coming to the web, uh, which may be not that ambitious like Wave, but uh, going into that direction? Well, I don't know, can you glue Meteor to a different API, for example? Um, since I've been uh, experimenting in that field, I think operational transform, which is the general algorithm behind uh, Google Docs that you can collaboratively in real time work on the same document and not overwrite each other's changes all the time. Um, there are now the first libraries for Node.js and for other back-end languages as well. Um, I think that is something that will really come in the future that everyone will be capable of handling operational transform events and also emitting them so that you basically just have a front end and you receive these events and manipulate your page in real time according to these events happening. Basically not only meaning you would have a uniform API to get in new content in real time, but maybe even watch someone typing the, the new content in real time, which might be kind of overkill, but it will be possible and that would be pretty great. Uh, but it was, would still depend on the API provider to actually give these capabilities to me to subscribe to these events, right? Or 
how is it how is it being done? I mean, I would need to ask the Google Plus API in this case to say, hey, if anything changes on this uh, thing, uh, give me a call, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So it, uh, all API providers need to implement this then. But if there's a, like a certain standard, that helps a lot, I guess. Pubsec, exactly. yeah. 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 And there are also more and more cloud services like PubNub and Pusher that will help with these things too. More questions to this? Otherwise I would have a different question. So it's on the web track. Um, and you already touched this topic a bit uh, in how, how you want uh, APIs to evolve. In your case the web body <coughs> API and the gamepad API. Um, but in general, we see Google pushing a lot in the direction of replacing any replacing any um, desktop system, or at least it makes it uh, totally uh, indifferent uh, which underlying system you have, because you have Chrome installed and there is everything you need. Uh, what do you feel as some people that are really experienced with the web and with APIs still missing? Uh, as a building block for replacing your desktop uh, OS, if anything. Uh, so what I tried to do once was building uh, a cool music player like iTunes or Winamp. Winamp is not that cool, but um, I, I tried to build that. Uh, Winamp is very retro. Yeah, oh, it's retro. Okay. <laughs> Remember tomorrow? Okay. Um, but the, the, the problem that I encountered was that you don't have access to the local file system for very good reasons, of course. You have the Chrome apps. Yes, well, okay, but that's, okay, you, you do have access to the file system in Chrome apps, but that's not very an open environment. I'm sorry to say that on a Google No, event, that's true. But um, uh, that's one thing that I'm really lacking at the moment, because otherwise, I think the, the file system API will be one step to have almost a web OS, like not the web OS, but web based operating system. Um, I actually think we are getting pretty close. I mean, with the Fire Reader API, you actually can, can start doing this kind of stuff somewhat. <laughs> you know, there, there is an API, and it's just a matter where you can actually allow a page to do on your disk whatever you want. The API is already specified. Um, <coughs> For me, uh, I actually think, for me personally, Chrome OS is already viable in, in, in a sense. I, I, if there was a proper web editor, which would not suck, I would actually be on my Chromebook full time, I guess. Sublime HTML. <laughs> yeah, something like that, because let's be honest, Ace still sucks and anything else is still not really comfortable. But for me personally, I'm already there. I think what is really missing, and again, Chrome has on the app, on the extension side has the first step in the direction is like hardware access to do uh, Bluetooth, to do serial ports, to do USB, whatever. Um, but after that, I guess we are pretty much there now. We have actually hardware uh, graphics acceleration to do. Uh, 3D, there's like a 3D editing tool now, which is it completely in the browser, which is actually performing you know, mediocre, but it, I mean, it's amazing, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, At least mediocre. <laughs> and there is, we, we are playing music in the browser, we are uh, doing shaders, um, games. the games are already there, we have game pads, apparently. Um, so, so the terminal is really messy. No. There is no terminal. <laughs> Uh, SSH, yes. No, there is. It's a Java, Java based SSH. No, there's a purely JavaScript written terminal. It works pretty well. Oh, it works. Oh, sorry, just skip you. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a, a Chrome extension, if you use Chrome, uh, which uses libssl as, as underlying open SSL um, as a C library. So it's, it's pure, no Java thing uh, needed. Okay. Um, and in response to you, uh, that's a proprietary system uh, with Chrome apps, I totally agree. But uh, as always, uh, the Google teams are just 
a bit far ahead with any anybody else, and they have enough resources to push out things to show what's what's what could be possible. And you see that, for example, Mozilla with the um, Firefox OS is is going in basically the same direction of doing everything on the web um, or as a web app on on your system. So I guess uh, eventually these APIs. Uh, get in the same direction and get aligned into a standard. It's just a matter of time. I think a couple of specific things I know um, from more from the mobile side. One of the biggest challenges on mobile is uh, is the memory, the way that browsers will just wipe out uh, what's the current running app, and so apps need a way to be able to persist and no notify when they're going to be uh, when they're going to be closed and so on. That's kind of a specific one. But it's a very important one if we want to create rich interactive apps. Uh, and uh, generally, I think on the mobile, like you've sort of alluded to some of these points about Chrome and, and Firefox, I think they have to converge more. The standards have to converge more because every mobile platform is making their own APIs for all of these things, like uh, being able to run processes in the background uh, that, uh, that, that take away the whole benefit of doing JavaScript in the first place. So there needs to be more. Uh, efforts on, on common APIs for these newer features. Um, for me, what is what is missing really is um, is a, is, a, is a truly performant language. Uh, today, in web development, you have JavaScript, and uh, JavaScript is behind by a factor of ten or twenty behind a properly compiled C C plus plus. Um, and uh, the, so the general approach that you use today is that you use JavaScript to glue all the components together and if you need a component that needs a hardcore uh, performance, you, you use a component that is not written in JavaScript that provides that and usually you are pretty limited in what you, in what you can use. Uh, in the example of the WebOD API, that's a very good example. Um, you, uh, the way you go to your API is, is doing fast Fourier transforms all the time. It's, it's part of the API. You can access a stream in the, in the time um, uh, space or in the frequency space, and it does the FFT in between. Well, that FFT obviously is not written in JavaScript, uh, and, and if for some reason uh, I, 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 I'm using, I'm doing research really pushing the boundaries and I need to use a different transform, not the FFT, but some some other kind of transform, I'm out of options. There's nothing I can do to program my own and, and be efficient. So of course there is the there is native development and actually that's the missing piece that uh, makes a Chromebook potentially a complete operating system. Uh, so that's NACL, there is PNACL that is, uh, that is coming along, uh, which will make it even, even easier to port those native pieces between, um, between uh, different architectures. Um, but still, it's, uh, it's, uh, for me it would be much easier if simply uh, the language of choice for programming on the web had the performance of native C that would be the, the, the ultimate goal for me. Maybe Dart will get there. Maybe some, someday we'll get, we'll, we'll get something like uh, Go or, or even some other new language that we know how to compile to native code and, and, and stop losing this, uh, this factor of 10 performance. I mean, it, it makes me really laugh when people say, oh, my JavaScript is so fast. <laughs> That's because you're used to the web, but JavaScript is not fast by any standard. I just answered my own question for the sake of uh, completeness too. Uh, I just wanted to mention um, I do a lot of Android uh, development uh, now and there's just no way I could do this performantly and effectively uh, without an underlying system to, to run for example Android Studio and the Java compiler and so on. There's, there are some cloud-based things but the usability of that that don't come close to what uh, um, IntelliJ based IDEs offer. So there's, there's that for me, at least. Sorry. Sorry, I would like to add another one because that's easier to achieve than the one I have just described. 
it's um, uh, on uh, in mobile development. Um, mobile browsers have one specificity is that they provide a very rich interface for manipulating uh, HTML documents like the UI. Uh, you have pinch to zoom, you have double click to, to, to zoom as well. Uh, you can move around, zip around your page and so on. That's pretty powerful. As a document presentation interface, that's pretty powerful. And uh, the, the, the bad thing is, however, that if you're using HTML to create a mobile application, usually the first thing you do is you uh, disable all that. Because if you don't, then you're not getting the events at all. If you do a pinch to zoom, uh, the browser handles it, you're not, you're not even notified that the user has changed the, the zoom level on your application. Um, and, uh, and then, <coughs> once you do that, well then, of course, you're on a mobile, so you want to have uh, swipes and pitch to zoom and all that. So, uh, instead of using the, 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 the um, beautifully refined, you know, pinch to zoom and then gesture recognition of, of Android or, or of the iPhone, you are back to re-implementing them in JavaScript, uh, trying to uh, to be as good as uh, as uh, you know the other. Poorly. It's, it's not as good. Any any library that I have seen is not as good as what the native platforms can define. And uh, you have no way of telling the system that. Please continue using your pinch to zoom, but I want to be aware of it when you do it. Because, for example, I like your pinch to zoom, continue pinch to zooming, but swipes from left to right, I need to intercept because those do something different in my application. And there is no uh, today, I, I, know, I don't know an, uh, an API for doing that. Just because uh, it's something that I didn't touch in my talk, there are some more browser technologies that are being filled in, polyfilled by PlatformJS and therefore by Polymer. And one of them is Microsoft's um, pointer events standard, which is actually a decent standard proposed by Microsoft, which first of all unifies mouse inputs and touch input under one event bus, so to speak, so you don't need to do the distinction between now do we have a mouse, do we have a touch, do we have both, what do I use, and also has uh, defines that the browser interpolates for you what just happened, so we actually will get events swipe left, swipe right, and stuff like that, so and that will be unified across browser, that is like the first step into the direction that you just told, so that's actually kind of cool. Um, just for, for you, um, I, I was I was one of the guy that uh, I think one of the two guys that actually bought an Bebo's phone. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, I was very happy with that, and maybe uh, um, uh, apps writing in pure HTML was fun there, and now the people are getting used to it. Um, yeah, they they actually had an, an, the app development as an as a, uh, cloud services and. The only thing what, what was really uh, Java was like the one app that connects your browser window to the to the mobile phone, like debugging stuff. Yeah, that this was uh, a very decent uh, ID for web development stuff. Yeah, and what what you said like um, <coughs> um, all these events that are handled very very decent by the by the US just to say yeah, I just want to handle this <coughs> another way is actually I think. Um, the right way, and, and I hope that uh, Firefox OS is also um, going in this direction. Just let let you um, intercept very um, specific stuff. And yeah, as and as on, on desktop development, I hope the web will win, so that we have like this just one platform. The web will prevail. So, oh, comments. Participation. Yes. Um, your talk inspired me again in, in something I remember from Rito Meyer talking about content providers on Android in 2009. It was this idea of a API sponge in a way. So you always talk to that and that is talking to the API. And when we talk about RESTful APIs and the understanding of what it is, it's always the same. And I wanted to have something like that in the browser. It should really 
draw the data to me so that also something like file access is no longer needed because even if I'm not connected to the web, I have access to all these beautiful cloud sponges. So I can write something to whatever Flickr uh, service and the service says, yeah, yeah, it's saved. It's actually just saved on something, some component and when I'm back connected or if I want to connect, then it's putting it into the cloud. Um, so something like that is really missing and uh, it would make a lot of sense to, to see something like that, I do believe. I just want to mention that you maybe should look at uh, no backend movement. That's exactly what they want to do. They want to get rid of backend. They want their APIs that are just clean and nice and they don't want to care what's going on behind it. So I just want to save it. And I don't save file, blah, blah. Yes, yeah, it's a different topic. It's a little, it's retro though. Um, yesterday, I guess, was the last day for iGoogle, um, this uh, homepage thing, and I, I, I was wondering if any of you had any thoughts on why it was gone, because I'm kind of missing it already. And I know, I, I mean, maybe I was the only person in the world who used it, but it was really pretty great, because, you know, I follow maybe 20 or 30 people, and not so much their Twitter feed or so, but, you know, what they're writing to their actual blogs and such like this, and, you know, there's about 10 or 11 things I kind of want to know about when I turn on my computer. I just always felt like, okay, there it all is, and I could kind of go from there to what I was doing. And for some reason, it didn't fit in the way the web should work anymore. So, Martin, why did you delete iGoogle? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no, I, I have to go uh, a bit more philosophical than that. Um, the, the first company I worked for, um, which was ST Microelectronics, actually the first day I joined, uh, they just killed a five year long project which was to build uh, the next, uh, ST Microelectronics is a, is a computer chip uh, uh, company, so the, they had a five year, year project to build the next microprocessor um, and they just killed it. So the, the atmosphere was not great on, on the day I joined. Uh, lots of teams were out of work, but uh, basically the guys selling the processor told them we have no customers, stop this. And in, retros in retrospect it was a, a great decision. Because it meant that uh, the company was focusing on uh, what was actually bringing in revenue and the technologies that were needed in the field. And actually all the building blocks and the knowledge and the teams that worked for five years on these new processors they were quickly redirected to a new project that was reusing a lot of that stuff. That was again another processor but slightly different and so on. Uh, contrast that with uh, my years at Amazon where uh, I joined uh, when Amazon bought my company doing ebooks for, uh, for the Kindle. And, uh, and very quickly, uh, of course, the website of the company www.mobipocket.com was completely obsolete because now the technology was used to drive the Kindle ecosystem. And if you check it, the URL still exists. There is still an ebook retail website at www.mobipocket.com. It's just completely empty of content and it lives there as a ghost town. And I'm pretty sure they are still paying 5k dollars per month to Rackspace to host it because I'm pretty sure no one was arsed. Uh, with actually changing the hosting contract uh, when when they made it a, go, a ghost town. Um, so, um, but that was down to a lack of decision process. Nobody could take the decision to shut this down because you know it's a decision. You have to decide something, and that's scary, and nobody will take responsibility for deciding something. So. Um, uh, and I think it's the sign of a healthy company uh, that uh, there are lots of projects and that in the end some are killed and some, some get continued. Um, that's how we are organized at Google. There are lots of projects. Uh, there is, you could say there is a lack of direction, maybe. Uh, the direction is, is go ahead and, and, and try it out and innovate 
and, uh, and, uh, and start new things. That's the direction. Um, but then you have to prune those things. And at the scale we're at, um, I don't believe that Iberville is something that really maybe made sense for our scale. It's, it's a, it would be a great project for a company on a, sm on a smaller scale. <coughs> but it's not for us. And I think that's a sign of the health of the company that lots of projects are started and stopped to make room for the important ones. Um, yeah, I think uh, speaking of a smaller company, NetVibes is kind of interesting. So I wanted to ask what you think of NetVibes because um, it's kind of always been an alternative or you haven't used it. Yeah, so I, I assume it's still running, if it is. Uh, yeah, do check that out, because that was kind of a similar concept. Um, I think that it's a little bit like Reader as well, you know. Um, I think that the trend has been uh, much more towards social and following people's streams and intelligently recommending, or well, the server intelligently recommending things rather than setting things up. And that, to me, is, is my biggest perception of where things like Reader and iGoogle didn't take off in, in kind of mainstream scale is that people just don't want to have to maintain. It's not just the setup, it's maintaining because you know people stop RSS feeds just as soon as they start it. And if you have to keep that pruned and keep it up to date a lot, you know, that's where the server can add a lot more value and intelligently recommend instead. Kind of what, what I wanted to say, if I, uh, from the consumer side, I actually never understood how you would actually use iGoogle. And, and by that I mean iGoogle tried to be a lot of things and was not really good at any of them. So it tried to be somewhat like a feed aggregator, like the first signs of a social network and weather notifications. So um, for each and every one of these aspects there are services which do them much better because they focus on that one thing and the only good thing I could have was like your homepage because you always went to Google when you open up the browser. So that was like the selling point. But you could just you know, use another homepage. So, um, and in the end, I, Google was just like, like a bunch of iframes arranged as tiles for me. So I, I, actually, I, I never used it, so I, don't, I cannot feel for you and say I miss it as well. But um, I, I would say just move on, look around. There are probably services out there that are much better suited for you. There are a lot of fish in the sea. <laughs> I think it was also an interesting technology in the fact that it was trying to collaborate and get these iframes communicating with each other. I think that's where the technology's kind of moved on to because we've got better ways of doing that with pure client-side technologies and, and using third-party authentication using technologies like OAuth to compose it all on the web page without having this whole framework that Shindig and Open Social was trying to do. I just wanted to pass it on. Didn't want to cut you off. You wanted to say something. Yeah, it's, it's actually some point came up here when you were talking about this bit more philosophical thing is um, that in, in web uh, component which is missing is the, uh, the trust and that it will stay forever, at least for me. So you put a lot of effort in configuring things and then it gets away because the company is bored or they don't want to uh, make the project any longer. And it's, for example, you, again, the example was Google+. Plus. So today, we can't imagine that Google+, Plus is shut down in five years, but five, Google Reader was five years ago something. It was the semantic map and all this blogosphere thing. So it was not imaginable that this really potential project will disappear. And now we see it not there anymore. So this trust is in a bit going away and Google is showing us uh, also in a, in a good way, hey, um, don't belong too much on this technology. Um, it will stay for some years and then maybe we take it away. So we also learn. Now I have a new reader or um, I read different things. So, so we also learn, learn by that. Um, so I think it's still a problem in the web, um, but uh, we grow with it. Uh, if nobody else wants to talk about like uh, iGoogle, I, I would like to <laughs> switch to another topic. Let's uh, put iGoogle to, uh, to rest. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, so, um, I'd like to talk a bit, a bit about uh, APIs and, and especially your talk. Um, 
So I um, I'm part of a hackerspace here in Berlin called uh, Seabase, and we have made very good um, experiences with just not using RESTful APIs, but using RPC. So we've kind of standardized on JSON RPC at the moment. It re uh, really very uh, it fits the model that we think we have. Like you just it's chaotic. You just put a box, you open the port H eighty, and you uh, start accepting like things like switch light on, switch light off. Uh, and my experience with professional customers as a freelancer is that once you open up uh, building a RESTful API, uh, the discussion starts. Like, um, for example, I, uh, um, I, I, wrote, I wrote a proposal for a JSON object that represents an article, a very simple thing. I posted it to, uh, to my clients, and a week later, um, I asked them some questions, and I thought, like, what do you think about this nested... I put in a nested object called metadata, which contained all the metadata, and it turned out that they had a four-hour-long heated discussion uh, what to put in there and what not to put in there and, and how to arrange all the, the parts. And do you know any way to prevent... Um, customers from... No, 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 not, not customers, but also, like, if, if, if we would say, in, in Seabase, we would say, let's do a REST API for everything, then we would have endless discussions and, and not come to a point where we have a working API. Is there, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of a, like a user experience or developer experience thing. Is there uh, design patterns that you can follow or is there any, any thing that you can point us to? Do we have an answer? That's no a, magic bullets. Um, <laughs> no. I think that uh, one of the things people sometimes miss is like, what's the purpose, right? What's the point of the rest? And if you're not getting the benefits of making it simple and intuitive and everything, then you know, don't use it or, or do the whole cheat, you know, the cheat way, which is post, right? Use post for everything sort of thing. <laughs> um, but um, one thing that's sometimes missed here is <coughs> the whole modeling. And when I say verbal for nouns, it's kind of an interesting. Uh, idiom because also what it, it sort of means two things, right? It sort of means like let's just uh, treat everything that is nouns and run actions on it, but it also means like turn the nouns into verbs. Um, so what you can sometimes do if you have uh, some complex operation or some operation that you can't easily conceive of uh, as, a, as a sort of resource is like you know, turn that action into a transaction. You know, we have this concept of a transaction which is a, a, an event that takes place um, that, that transforms you know, some state of the system, you can actually make that into a resource. It may not always be the way, maybe that's going to be too dogmatic and you just want to keep it simple, but it can certainly work. So again, do you want to give your example of the, the, that you asked? Yeah, do you want to talk about that? <coughs> I just recently asked them, um, the problem is that if you, for example, have users and tasks, uh, tags and you can of course assign one tag to a user so you put to that user you can maybe also assign like five tags to that user so you put five tags to that one user but what happens if you want to put like five tags to 200 users so I wasn't I wasn't aware how I would do that restfully because I would uh, in, a, in my uh, understanding of restful service I would do 200 requests to 200 users for the same file. You create a you create a list of users, you create a list of tags, and then you combine these IDs. So that can be three transactions. But where do you put it to? Because I can't put it. Yeah, that's what I give you one. Yeah, 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 but that's that was the problem. I mean, you can't put it to the user because it's not one user. You can't put it to a tag because it's not one tag. But then you can create a new resource. So for example, if I have uh, the user uh, Jan and I want to have like five tags, so I post or put to that user the five tags. But if I want to post that uh, or put that five tags to like 200 users, where do I post it to? Yeah, so first you create a user list yes. and you put the 200 users into it, that's one call. Then you create a list of your tags. 
another goal, and then you have the resource to combine a list. Right. right. So, so yeah. So I'll repeat that because you, so yeah, you're saying create a list of users, which is you might create like as a group, like a resource called yeah. a group, and then a second one would be you create the list of tags, a tag group, and then a third one, which or or some command on where on the the user or a mapping. Yeah, a mapping. So then, yeah, then you have you need another resource is basically the point, and yeah. and that's also what I was getting at. Another solution there is just to have one extra resource, right? So you could have a resource called a multi-tagging, um, if you wanted to. Then you could basically say like a multi-tagging is a list of users and a list of tags, and now you've got a resource like it's, a, it's an actual transaction multi-tagging. So you'd have multi-tagging slash one two three, which is something you might have done five days ago. If you want, you can purge them from the system or whatever, but theoretically, you've always got these multi-tagging actions. And they can have states as well, because if that was a long transaction, you know, you could just uh, put that into the server, say like, yep, yeah, we want to do this multi-tagging. The server will respond straight away with a 200 and say, yeah, we've got that multi-tagging, but the 200 doesn't mean that it's actually been done. It just means it's got the multi-tagging sitting there, so it's, it knows that it needs to do it. And then you can start querying the state. You know, if it was like a, 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 web, a browser app, a browser app, then you might do it using an AJAX refresh, or you might send the user an email later on, or whatever. But you know, the main the main point there is creating nouns from verbs. Just to get, give my to say the original question, um, I have felt that as a rule of thumb, usually you you should do RESTful APIs if you have if you're pretty close to a database or working with collections. And RPC usually maps pretty good onto a single object on which you want to operate. So there is not even necessarily a rule against mixing those two, that you do those set operations or collection operations via a RESTful API, and once you have extracted the one element or a group of elements you want to work on, then these actually take RPC calls to do expensive server-side uh, computation, which might even take a while. So, uh, so I know the kind of project that you do, so that you usually have like this one argument where you can switch a light on and a light off, so that rest doesn't even make sense, because usually you have collections, and when you have single objects to work on, there's no point in actually being restful. Yeah, of course, of course it doesn't make sense to switch on light and, uh, off, on and off with, with rest, but the, um, so maybe, maybe, <laughs> Maybe because you we're talking, you know, you're calling it developer experiences. Maybe we need similar tools that user experience designers have for APIs. Uh, do you know of anything that, uh, like, for for user experience, there's there's things like paper prototyping and so on. Is there paper API prototyping? Do you know of any good ideas to do that? So there are some tools like what I'm, what I was talking about with those playgrounds, and then. Um, some of those API platforms, I don't know the specifics, but you know they will very quickly let you generate an API from from uh, code, you know, from your objects. So then you've got a playground to start making calls against it straight away. Uh, I've lately been using apiarit.io, where basically you specify an API like this is a resource. There is like you can put any idea in here. Where you put a get on there, you will get something like this. You will post something like this will come back. And it actually instantly creates a mock server for you, and you can write your client again and check out if it actually works out or not. And the, it also checks your description of the API to a good repository, so it's versioned and everything. So uh, my experience has been pretty good doing that because actually specifying API, writing a client again, and then at the third, third step actually writing the server side um, makes like the development process somewhat fun because you actually have like the, the finished front end to click around and see if your back is actually working, which is kind of cool. What is it? API.io. But there are, there are some other services like it which were the slides. Uh, and if I can contribute um, a bit of experience, not for, from API design, but from file format design, which is not so different, uh, the, the two biggest mistakes that I have done is, uh, is uh, one was to serialize stuff. When you want a clearly defined interface, avoid anything that looks like an automatic serialization, even if it looks, uh, you know, uh, very easy to do. Um, 
you write on paper all the fields that you have in your API and you don't let anything generate that for you. Uh, of course, you need to version that of course, uh, as well. And uh, the second thing that was very tempting uh, was to add uh, some form, like you said, a metadata, a generic metadata container where, where, where people would put anything they want. Um, but again, anything you want is, uh, is uh, the contrary of a well-defined API, so uh, that's, uh, that was a mistake as well. So I, I have to bring this to an end now. Um, it was surprisingly, we had something to talk about. Uh, so thanks for everyone who asked questions or contributed to the discussion. Um, uh, as part of the organizer team, I really want to thank everyone who uh, contributed to the web track. I think uh, it was uh, really interesting to see all the different technologies and, and talks. Uh, it was, uh, I heard really, really well uh, uh, comments on that, so thank you for, for making it that awesome. Um, you can tap now. Uh, <coughs> and um, now we have uh, only five minutes to grab every, everything that's belonging to you to actually wrap up uh, in, the, in the atrium where we met this morning, if you came on time. Uh, so, uh, see you in a bit. <laughs>